Maybe it's obvious to you that my wife has a passion for orphan care. Um, and it is something that we celebrate as a, as a church, celebrate maybe the wrong word, we recognize as a church each November Orphan Care Awareness Month. Only scripture does not identify a set aside month to heighten our awareness to the plight of the fatherless. No, God's word presents um, <laughs> our concern with those who are in need as a matter of true religion. We can see that as a case in point within our text this morning, I am reading from Zechariah chapter 7, verses 4 through 12. Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me, ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous, and the Negev and the western foothills were settled? And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said, administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly they turned their backs, covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. The first question we must ask ourselves today is why do we worship? According to God's word, the Jews were ordered to observe only one fast. It came on the day of atonement, which we find spelled out in Leviticus 23 verse 29. Yet, after Israel had fallen into exile, the Jews began observing four additional major fasts. They fasted on specific days because each of those days pointed to a time that calamity had fallen upon the nation. And now the Jews had been allowed to return to Jerusalem under a new Persian rule, and as they were completing a new temple for their worship, they began to ask if they still needed to observe those additional fasts. Yet here's the thing. God never cared one iota about any of their extra fasts, only about why they were fasting to begin with. The Hebrew text in verse 5 emphasizes something that our English translations miss. The Lord actually says, were you really fasting for me? Even for me? The answer is no. The Jews of Zechariah's day had been fasting in order to get something from God, not because their sin grieved the heart of God. Israel was concerned with the consequences of sin, the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the exile of their people, but not so much with the commission of their sin. In other words, they just wanted to avoid any disaster that sin might cause. The idea behind the Hebrews' fasting was thus manipulative. They saw fasting as a means to an end, as a means to regain the former blessings that they had since lost. But now that things were looking up again, now that things were promising again, they thought to simply stop. It actually forces you and me to ask a couple of questions. Is the committing of my sin, is that what concerns me? Or is it 
just the consequences that might come from my sin? Is my worship habitual and ritualistic? Or is it honoring and relational? I'll state it even more plainly, I hope. God is pleased with our worship if we worship out of a desire for Him, not if we worship from a desire of something we might get from Him. We must never do what we do from a mindset of scoring good conduct points, our religious points with God. Instead, our worship must entirely extend from our love for Him. We sang earlier in this service, Better is One Day. It is a song based on Psalm chapter 84 that our soul longs and even faints for the Lord. That our hearts are satisfied alone within his presence. When the Lord entered into covenant with his people, he promised to be their God. This is what a saving relationship with God is all about, that we would receive not merely the gifts of God, his blessing of prosperity, his blessing of peace, his blessing of joy, but that we would receive God himself as our greatest gift. The chosen nation of Israel should have reveled in the presence of the Almighty, in the presence of God as their Redeemer. How much more true should that be for us, the elect church today? God's gift of himself finds its highest expression in the Lord Jesus Christ, who Titus 2 and verse 4 says, gave himself up to redeem us. The promise of the gospel is that we could not ascend to the Lord through our fasting or through our feasting. No, the Lord had to descend to us. There it is, right? The gift of God's presence. Christ came among us, born of a virgin, to live the life we could not live, to die the death we deserve, to be resurrected from the grave, and to ascend to the Father. That is the core of the gospel which I strive to preach in some way or another every Sunday morning. But before Christ left from his earthly ministry, Jesus promised never, never, never to leave his disciples alone to leave them as orphans. No, he said, I will send among you the person of the Holy Spirit who now indwells us. Ah, there it is again, yes? God's presence with us. What is it that God in return wants for the gift of his presence? Does he want our readings? Does he want our prayers? Does he want our songs? Does he want our giving and our teaching and our weekly gatherings? As a byproduct, we can certainly say yes. Yes, he does. But those are simply that. They are a byproduct. None of those actions mean a hill of beans if we lose sight of the heart of our worship. And it's all about Jesus, isn't it? Yep. And Christ's gift of his presence should prompt us in everything that we do. I'm going to say that again. His gift of his presence should prompt you and me in everything that we do. We must then ask ourselves the questions, how then shall we live? We cannot live lives apart from what it is that God says. Zechariah 7 verse 12 provides one of the strongest statements in the Old Testament concerning the inspiration of Scripture. The prophet speaks of words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. True religion must find its basis in the teaching of scripture. 
It's not just a book of good thoughts. It's not just a moral book. It is a word communicated by the Holy Spirit concerning our duty to the Lord. And when Zechariah speaks about our duty as believers, he points to things that are found in God himself. Listen again to verses 8 through 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. How shall we then live? You and I are called to live in such a way as to imitate the very one whose presence is with us and in us. You see, we are called, the church is called, to become the presence of Christ in the world. Do not miss that. If Christ lives in you, if he is present with you, he calls you to be his presence in the world. The day from our text in Zechariah, I especially draw your attention to two of God's attributes that we must imitate. These, mind you, are not optional. They are commands. If Christ is in you, that you would embody his presence in the world. He is merciful. So you and I must exercise compassion. Now here's an interesting question. What can we give to the almighty Lord of the universe who needs nothing? It's an interesting question. Yes, what can we give to the Lord of the universe who needs nothing. Allow me to suggest that the answer is to love our neighbors who need our compassion. In his keynote address at the 54th National Prayer Breakfast on February 2nd, 2006, the rock star Bono of U2 said this, God is in the slums in the cardboard boxes where the poor play house. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives, and God is with us if we are with them. And Bono goes on to say, it's not a coincidence that within the scriptures, poverty is mentioned more than 2,100 times. It's not an accident. That's a lot of air time. So Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 40, as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Do you hear those words? As you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. When we do it to whoever needs our love and compassion, we do it as it unto the Lord of the universe. There's the answer to the question. We may wear Christian symbols around our necks. We may erect Christian symbols by crosses in our sanctuaries. But any true Christian, any true church must walk in the world with love toward our fellow man if we are to bear the signs of Jesus Christ in reality. Zechariah specifically names the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, and the poor. That covers a pretty wide canvas, doesn't it? As we acknowledge Orphan Awareness Sunday this morning, I want to focus on the fatherless. You see, dealing with the orphan is not just a mercy issue. Oh, if only. You know, like Bono says in his speech, we're good at charity. Yeah, yeah we, let me just put a little dime on it. But maybe we're not so good with justice. Yet the orphan crisis makes a farce, if we're honest, of the idea of justice. It mocks our pieties. It doubts our concern. It questions our commitment. That's Bono, too. According to the United 
Nations Children's Fund, and based on its definition of an orphan, there are currently, as my wife pointed out, 153 million orphans worldwide. Children are often relinquished due to war, natural disaster, poverty, disease, stigma, medical needs. Kids who are not adopted in the U.S. system typically get passed from foster home to foster home to foster home. And on the international scale, they remain in impoverished orphanages until they age out of the system, which is twice as likely to happen among children like Valen who have disabilities. Once these children age out of the system, they face vulnerable situations that if you really studied those situations should break every single one of our hearts. And yet again, the orphan crisis is not about our sympathy. It's about justice. In 2004, about 240,000 lives across Southeast Asia were tragically lost to the most devastating and deadliest tsunami as a result of Mother Nature ever to hit land. Here is the thing. Every day, every day, an estimated 5,700 children become orphans. That is a preventable, unnatural tsunami every day. One way to attack this tsunami is by choosing to adopt a child or children in need. Another way to attack this tsunami is by training to become a foster parent. Another way to attack this tsunami is by targeting one of the biggest, ugliest roots of the orphan crisis. Do you know what it is? It's global poverty. You see, many orphans are dropped off at orphanages by mothers who are incapable of feeding their children. And so these mothers think to themselves that their children will at least receive one meal a day in an orphanage. And that's more than the mother can provide. We cannot be okay with that. We can't be okay with that. Are you okay with that? We can't be okay with that. No mother should be forced to choose between keeping her child and feeding her child. So we can fight the orphan crisis by partnering with organizations that empower vulnerable women with employment. We can work to stop the cycle of poverty in its tracks. We can improve impoverished conditions and economies, and we can help keep families together. Do you know, I mean, I, I didn't know. Um, you know, we get Christmas presents each year probably for family members and such. And there are organizations that are trying to fight the issue that women face across the globe who do not have income by creating jobs for them, by making things that you can purchase as gifts for people for Christmas. That's practical. Something that I think everybody can do. Because if you say, what can I do in the midst of the tsunami? Do something. I, I, I don't know about your God, but my God would say, I've got to do something. Jason Johnson of the Christian Alliance for Orphans says, orphan care equals a vast buffet of opportunities to care for the marginalized, the abused, the neglected, and orphaned children and their families. Not everyone is called to do the same thing, but certainly... If you are someone who claims to have been adopted by God, you are no doubt called to do something. This is a realistic expectation for us all. It's a biblical one. James writes to the church. He writes to us. He says this in chapter 1, verse 27. If you say, I don't know how you can escape this. What is true religion? 
Listen to what James 1 says, 127. He says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I mean, did, did you hear it? I mean, I, I, it's not in the Bible. It's on a sheet of paper right here. It's in your Bible, though. You can look. James 1, 27. True religion is this. That we would care for the orphan. That we would care for the orphan. That we would visit the widow. That we would keep ourselves unspotted from this world. What I know for certain is if we are going to be the church of the living God, if we are going to be Christ followers, if we have Christ's presence within us, then we need to be his presence to the world. I return again to Bono. It's truly a great speech. You can go on YouTube, type it in, National Prayer Breakfast, Bono. A number of years ago, he says, I met a wise man who changed my life. I was always seeking the Lord's blessing. I would be saying, look, I've got a new song. Would you look out for it? I have a family. I'm going away on tour. Please look after my family. Lord, I have this crazy idea. Could I have your blessing on my idea? And this wise man asked me to just stop. He said, stop asking God to bless what you're doing. Get involved in what God is doing. But it's already blessed. Well, let's get involved in what God is doing. God, as I say, is always, always with the poor and the fatherless. And that's what he's doing, and that's what he's calling us to do. You know, I mean, I, I'm probably going to offend some people right now, and I apologize in advance for the offense that I'm going to cause. I really, really don't care about church programs. I'm sorry, I just don't. I care about the church being programmed to be the presence of Christ in the world. That's what I care about. And I know that's not popular to say in our culture where it's like, hey, make sure we have something for everybody. Make sure everybody feels comfortable. Make sure everybody feels like they're having their back scratched. I don't want your back scratched. I want you to be Christ's presence in the world. I really do. That's what I want. And if that's a fireable offense, as your pastor, fire me. But that's what I'm going to preach over and over and over again. Be the body of Christ in the world. That's what we're called to do. Look, I, I did not want to adopt. I didn't want to do it. And it's hard. It's not easy. There's a lot of things that go along with it. But is it beautiful? Oh, it's beautiful. Is it beautiful, Pam Stafford? It's beautiful. Is it always easy? <laughs> you know, and I realize that, well, geez, now I, even me, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm past the age limit in some countries to even adopt. My wife continues to say, I'll, I'll, I'll do another one if you'll let me. And I don't know. <laughs> I just think that we can't ignore what God is calling us to do. It's hard to read the words that the Lord Almighty sent by His Spirit and not see the way that He is far less concerned about our religious gatherings and our organized ceremonies, and He is far more concerned about our involvement in social justice. And again, I mean, the church doesn't maybe even like to hear those words, social justice, but it's biblical. 
Isaiah 58. Read the entire chapter. It's a gorgeous chapter. I love Isaiah 58. I'm just going to read to you verses 6 and 7. The Lord Almighty says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? And oh, by the way, make sure you offer a lot of programs. I, I, that's, not, that's not in Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is saying, if you want if you want to get involved in God's blessing, be a blessing to people who need it. I mean, I'm just asking you, is that what the church is supposed to be? Is the church supposed to be what Isaiah 58 says? Yes or no? Is the church supposed to be what Jesus says when he says, that which you've done to the least of these, you've done to me? Is that what the church is supposed to be? I'm just saying, read the Bible. Find me anywhere in the Bible. Find it for me anywhere. Where God is not saying the church is supposed to be my presence, not here, but there. Find it for me. I can't find it. And I grew up in a culture that basically said the church was about me. That's the way I grew up. It's about me. And, you know, if, if it gets to a point where, well, the church is not really ministering to what I want, well, then I need to go find a church that will. Boy, that is a bad, bad, bad ecclesiology. It is such a bad ecclesiology. That just means doctrine of the church. The church is supposed to be a place where you are equipped with the Word of God to be the presence of God in the world. That's the responsibility of the church. When we lose sight of that, we lose sight of what God has called us to be. Let us therefore reflect God's presence outside these walls. Yes, let's love one another inside these walls. Let's not bicker. Let's not complain. Let's not feel like we have to have an opinion about everything. Because we really don't. We just don't. What we need is to grow closer in our walk with Jesus so that we can point others to Jesus. Isn't that what we need? I say it is. After all, Jesus did not leave you and me as orphans. He sent his presence to us. Amen? And so now, shouldn't we send his presence through us in tangible ways out into the world? Is it easy, Mel and Charlotte Gunner? Is it easy? Is it worth it? Hey Amen, it's worth it. It ain't easy. It's worth it. Church is worth it. Let us be the hands and feet of Jesus, not just as we observe an Orphan Awareness Sunday, <laughs> but as we go. This is my prayer for Win Stanley Baptist Church for as long as you'll have me, is that we would be a people who go in the love, compassion, and justice of our Savior. Pray with me. Lord, we <coughs> fall short of the call that you have placed upon our lives every day. Today, I need the grace that you provide Jesus. Tomorrow, I need the grace that you provide Jesus. And that is true every day. I wish and I pray that we would 
and just repeat the gospel to ourselves every day. And as we hear the gospel proclaimed to ourselves, and as we understand the mercy that you have shown, the justice that it took for you to show that mercy because it required you going to an old rugged cross. And knowing that, we would turn from our sin and we would turn to others who need your mercy and your compassion. And we would see issues around us as justice issues. Christ be glorified here at Winstanley Baptist Church. Be glorified among your people. Let us focus on the main thing together. Let us focus on the main thing together. It's the gospel. It's clear. And let us be changed by it. Holy Spirit, make it so. I pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your name, be glorified. Amen. Amen. Um,